Hello and welcome to the Thursday process. I'm your host, Ian Richardson, and I'm joined by Israel Lang today. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, it's 1130 right now. We'll start at two minutes past the half hour. So if you need to go refill your coffee, grab some water, get a pen and paper, what have you, go ahead and do that now and we'll get started in two minutes. You at home right now, Israel? I am. Yeah. Yeah, I'm home. Uh, Fortunately, I don't have to travel as much anymore. So, yeah, you used to be on the road like 20, 25 weeks out of the year minimum, right? Yeah. 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 I now see. it's uh, maybe a handful of days a quarter. That's not bad. So. Yeah. The, uh, the pandemic really kind of shifted things and people became a lot more open to, yeah, sure. We'll just, we'll do it through teams. Yeah. We'll set it on a couple hour or even a half day zoom call yeah. or what have you. Yeah. Yeah. I, st I mean, I look forward to the on-site visits now. So mm -hmm. for those of you who are just joining, thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in just under 60 seconds. So if you want to go refill that, cup of coffee now's the time we'll be diving in right at 11 32 eastern or two minutes past the half hour local time yeah it's fun to go sit in a room with people these days it's so abnormal that it's like oh my god people <laughs> that, uh, right that comic where uh the person was excited to get an email back in the 90s and now you're excited to get mm -hmm. a letter <laughs> All right, it's two minutes past the half hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday process. I'm your host, Ian Richardson. I'm joined by my friend, mentor, colleague, Israel Lang, and excited to have you here today. A couple of uh, top of the show items, a quick disclaimer, the presentations on Thursday process are intended for educational purposes only. They should not replace independent professional advice or your own personal judgment. Statements of facts and opinions expressed are those of the participants individually. They do not represent the opinion or position of any employer or certifying body. Nothing presented on the show should be considered legal or financial advice. Also, a note, you may be watching this on demand. Today is March 2nd, my son's 12th birthday. Happy birthday, Desmond. If so, consider that the information has not been changed or updated since the original presentation. So keep that in mind. Quick little bit of housekeeping. You'll see the question and answer box up in the upper right hand corner. As you have questions, go ahead and send them out. We'll go, we will answer those live throughout the show and we'll have a little bit of space at the end for any final questions. Uh, there are polls throughout the Thursday process. They'll pop up on your screen. They're pretty straightforward, pretty simple polls. And when you answer those, that helps us steer what we should talk about next. So definitely appreciate people's participation in the polls. We do look at those reports and that's how we recruit future, future guests for the Thursday process. Last but not least, you'll see the handout section up on the right. That's where you can download the process we're talking about. If you're following along, I will try to call out points in the process as we cover them, but go ahead and download that now so that you have it. Without further ado, a couple introductions. I'm Ian Richardson. I'm one half of Richardson & Richardson, along with my wife, Carrie. I uh, ran a MSP for 16 years, sold it then to 21, and co-founded this, uh, this operation to try to help out other MSPs and software vendors in the channel. And I'm joined by Israel Lang. Israel's been in the channel for 25 years and uh, has worked for a variety of organizations, including ConnectWise, the ConnectWise, the software company, HTG peer groups, multiple MSPs at the local, regional, and private equity national backed level. Israel, how's it going today? And uh, what are you focused on this week? Uh, uh, this week is going great, Ian. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity to kind of 
hopefully share a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of knowledge collected over the last uh, few years and over my career and mistakes that I've made. Uh, this week, I'm focused on hiring some key roles for some of the clients, uh, some of the organizations I'm working for, um, and just helping clients move or the organizations, they're not really clients because I'm embedded in them now, um, move their organizations forward, uh, meet their goals, uh, moving forward. Love it. Love it. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. What are we talking about today? Today, we are running through a process around service team capacity management, which is a mouthful, and I'm not going to say it three mm -hmm. times fast, but this was a bear that came up in my world constantly running an MSP. It comes up today trying to manage my capacity around uh, the services that we provide at R&R, &R and from our conversation before the show, Israel, you have run into this again and again and again. Just take a couple of seconds and give a little background as to what led to the creation of this process over uh, over the past 20 years that you've been in industry. Yeah, great. Thank you for the question, Ian. Um, well, I mean, a couple of different things, a couple of different avenues. One, uh, I've been in operations I mean, I started off my career as a help desk tech at a rural MSP or a rural ISP, internet service provider, literally helping grandmas install modems, 56K US robotic modems in their computers, gateway computers more often than not. Uh, and, uh, you know, installing Netscape via a handful of floppy disks. Um, and so, you know, from the early 90s through today, uh, it's all, you know, largely been focused on operations, uh, whether that's, you know, being an engineer, being a tech, managing them, leading them, uh, consulting with organizations that have a bunch of them. Um, and so, you know, it's always been how do you drive efficiency? How do you how do you balance um, uh, client expectations with, you know, generating a profit? Yep. And so uh, over the course of time, uh, this is kind of iterated. Uh, and then over the last three years, uh, when I was at my last organization, really became a focus, um, you know, during the pandemic uh, and then, you know, throughout uh, 21, 22. So um, that's the case. Uh, the other piece, just to add some context, um, Ian, is, uh, you know, in my consulting days, oftentimes, uh, and even today, as I uh, help organizations, one of the things they want to figure out is how to optimize their service department. And oftentimes that starts off as I'm frustrated with my service department. How do I make them better? Uh, and so there's a number of different ways that we start exploring that. Um, some of it service oriented and some of it just general business. Um, looking at some things that we'll talk about throughout the, today's conversation. Yeah, no. And, and I want to, I want to dive right into that, that, uh, that frustration that an owner or a leader in a in a service-based organization can feel towards their service team is almost tangible i remember many 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 times at my old msp being frustrated with performance and through the uh lens of hindsight more often than not i'm finding hey if, if i look at this honestly from the outside was it the service team that was underperforming or was it a lack of leadership from my desk. And more often than not, it was the second answer. It was, it was the second part. There was some sort of misfire. So looking, looking at the process, step one, you, you mentioned around collecting data and grabbing different data, data through how many tickets are coming in, how many incidents are coming in when you're busy how much time are you spending on them? But walk me through a little bit of that data collection, but also if, if you wouldn't mind just spending a couple of minutes on maybe helping how you've helped other leaders do a bit of self-reflection or self-analysis uh, self as to root cause of that yeah. frustration with service teams. Yeah. Um, so oftentimes when an owner, you know, in a, in a you know, probably $5 million, mm -hmm. um, up until a $5 million organization, and then some type of service leader or operations leader past that point, 
when they reach out to me or, or we have a conversation and they're frustrated about service delivery, um, you know, my, my first comment back to them is I'm, I'm happy to help you improve service delivery. Um, that being said, we're also going to have to look at some other business practices mm-hmm. and what those business practices are is I really want to see their agreement. Uh, I want to understand, you know, are they requiring their customers to their clients to have, get on a standardized stack or mm-hmm. are they discounting, you know, what's, what's their normal rack rate or per device per user rate and what percentage of their agreements, uh, are discounted below that standard rate. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and then, you know, what type of technology are they allowing to be in those uh, customers um, environments? Uh, because typically it's a com it's never, it's normally not all or one of those things in particular, like it's not just the service delivery or lack thereof. It's not just how your agreements are structured or what you're allowing in devi- environments. And it's not, uh, and it's not just what you're discounting. It's, it's, it's a combination of all three, but it, it's pretty, um, it is all three of those things. Right. So, yep. um, oftentimes what I first see is I see like they're, they're doing heavy discounting. Um, and, and oftentimes the, that that's compounded by they're not on a standardized stack or they're doing lots of one-offs. Mm-hmm. And so what that creates from a service delivery perspective, um, uh, is it creates challenges because the, their, the, your service team is supporting a lot of different technology. And oftentimes that technology is broken and they're, or, or outdated. And uh, then, and, and they're doing it at a discounted rate. So you compound all three of those things together and you have eroded margins in pretty, pretty considerable fashion, which then leads you to go like, why does my service suck so bad? Yep. So, and digging into that, that's like kind of the first thing that I want to look at and really get some common understanding around and 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 present uh, and make sure that everybody understands that's going on in the world. And, and that's, that's level set. Let's make sure that we all have common expectations and, and we agree on, given these set of circumstances, uh, what, what can be an expected result? What does good look like in that scenario? What's the plan to move from where they're at to where they want to be? And that includes yep. the service delivery component. So let's move that over to our process, the process we're talking about today. You know, one of the first things I want to under, you know, I'm hoping that your phone system can kind of collect data to understand when your phone call, when your phone tickets are coming in. Yep. Obviously, we're going to be able to track a lot of that through uh, email, through your PSA as well. And then you can start seeing some busy hours. Um, you can start seeing, hey, at, you know, Monday, from 9 a.m. till 1 p.m. is typically the busiest time for yep. tickets to be generated. So what do we need to do? Well, in some instances, in smaller MSPs, it's like, we're not going to do any project work on Monday. Monday is going to be ticket triage, ticket work, ticket closure. Let's make sure that we're not in a deficit um, coming out of Monday. And then, you know, then there's maybe some other busy periods throughout the week. So that you want to understand, you know, when when are you getting certain types of tickets? How many are you getting them? And then start staffing accordingly. Understand like, Hey, again, Monday is a really busy day. Let's mm-hmm. make sure that we got, we don't have a lot on sites. We're able to kind of tackle those reaction tickets and we're not doing projects on Monday. If we, if, if that's just not a thing that we can do. Yeah. The, the all hands on deck to, to receive the early morning flood. Right. And so the next part, the, the next two points, and for those of you following along, I'm, I'm looking at point two and three go hand in hand, which is around creating a formalized, documented, written down, communicated escalation process. So here's how we're going to escalate things. This is when it goes away from a, a tier one or a, a normal help desk tech to maybe an escalation tech or a uh, all the way up to a subject matter expert and how those, how those escalations flow, and then a tracking mechanism around escalations. Talk to us, like what, what you've, you've talked with a lot of different organizations. What are some of the thing, what are some of the common threads to make sure you have in this sort of documented process, things to avoid 
around an escalation process, some of the pitfalls or, or potential uh, bear traps that you could walk into when you do this. Um, just, just dive into some of the lessons learned around that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's, there's kind of a, uh, a spectrum here that I'm going to go through. So yeah, smaller MSPs, you know, typically what I would say under 5 million, it's really hard to have a dedicated project team. Typically your project guys are your smartest guys, your most experienced guys, your most talented guys and gals. Um, and so they they tend to also be your escalation point. Yep. So one of the things is you, know, you need to figure out a way to know how many tickets are being escalated out of your service desk or out, you know, out of your tiering system, your tier one, tier two. Mm-hmm. Um, how many of them are quick, what I would call quick tickets, quick fix tickets, you know, those kind of password resets, my printer doesn't work, how do I do this? Stuff that you typically can hopefully solve in 15 minutes or less. So you want to have that bucket as one bucket. Then on the escalated side, uh, escalation side, you want to understand how many of those are escalated and how much time is being spent in those escalations. So whether that's a service type, a work type, you know, depending mm-hmm. upon your PSA, there's a couple different ways you can track it, figure out the way, the best way to do that in your PSA and get, ask your, those escalation points to be very disciplined about um, uh, using that methodology to understand when they're when they're working on escalation t- escalated tickets then you can start seeing like typically if if that tech engineer is working 20 hours or more a week on escalated tickets it's probably time to say okay we're gonna need to carve out a dedicated person just to work on escalated tickets yep. so that's kind of like that five, that sub five million dollar msp hopefully as you get over the five million dollar mark you're able to have some dedicated um, project resources um, they're still probably going to be escalated to a little bit. So some of that that we just talked about still applies there. Um, but I think the next thing that you want to do once you get past that $5 million mark is you want your service manager or your ops manager or, you know, somebody in your side, your organization needs to start looking at what's getting escalated and why. And then you start creating some training around that, some documentation around that, and not just create the documentation, but then train to the documentation. Mm-hmm. Um, whether you do that over a lunch and learn with your with your service desk team, whether you do whether you have a, a pizza and game night uh, once a month, and you go over some of those uh, pr- uh, procedures, and you give them pizza, and you know you play Call of Duty or whatever mm-hmm. the game of the period is, and but you you give them thirty minutes, you ask for thirty minutes, and, and do that do that other stuff as as a reward for them sticking around and create yep. uh, creating that culture. So. Um, those are certainly some of the things that I would really encourage. You know, it goes back to, um, you know, you got to measure what matters and you got to inspect what you expect, right? Those two kind of cliched terms, but they really apply here, right? How many, how much time, how many tickets are we escalating? How much time are we spending at, on a, on that escalation? And what are the patterns? And the more you can move along that spectrum, you can start carving out resources understanding where your, your, where your organization needs trained or technology you need to revisit. Maybe your reference architecture is wrong and you need to go look at a different ticket because it keeps that, that technology keeps on causing problems that only your best and brightest can solve. Yeah. Well, and that, that, uh, that trend analysis is so key. One of the uh, things that we did some of the time, not all the time at my old MSP was look at, Hey, what are the most common, what are the most common recurring issues across this client, this type of client, maybe healthcare or manufacturing, this size of client or across yeah. all tickets yeah. for the past two weeks, four weeks. And whenever we would find something that just came up consistently across multiple organizations, we would point the cannon at it, like yeah. put everyone in a room, throw the ticket up on the wall and say, how can we make this go away? Is it changing the way we do things? Is it adding some sort of new tool? Is it an automation? Can we script it? Like, what do we have to do to just kill this ticket? And it didn't work all the time, but maybe 40% of the time, we would find some way to eliminate that workload just by putting enough brains on it and saying, all right, we're going to spend an hour with four people in the room. So we'll spend four hours of payroll to kill this thing. And then it's never going to come up again. Yeah. Yeah. So... And the other thing you can do with that escalation, um, uh, the, what I just talked about, the, the, that workflow, 
is mm-hmm. it goes back to the first point, right? What are the, you know, the profitability of your clients and how much is that escalation? Because you're having your most expensive engineers, your most expensive technologists and techs in the, in the organization work on those problems. It's going to impact the uh, agreement profitability. So ultimately, your goal is to either get the technology stable. Well, that's you know obviously the primary goal. B, um, you know, get uh, get whatever those issues are documented so that the lower cost, um, more readily available folks can solve that issue. And when that issue does creep up, you don't have your highest um, expense employee uh, solving those issues and, and uh, depleting your uh, margin revenue or your, your margin profile in those organizations. And this is one of those reasons why it's so important for every person in the team to track their time and then to create some, even if it's not fully loaded, right? If you got a guy who runs you $50 an hour and you got a guy who runs you $25 an hour, you don't have to necessarily carve out the work comp component and the benefits component, whatever, whatever, call it 50 and 25, call it 55 and 30. Just do some sort of standard format. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be close, right? This and is consistent. a yep. hand grenade thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah. There was a, there's a, one of the organizations I'm working with right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, this kid, this came up because uh, they had, they hired three new folks and they didn't put their burden cost in the PSA. And so we went to run some agreement profitability uh, and, and margin stuff and, and, uh, fortunately, we were able to quickly pinpoint the uh, the issue, but you know it showed up in the reports, and it was like, why did this stuff drop up? Drop, you know, bump up so quickly? Well, we had zero dollars in for those employees that were working a lot of those tickets, so uh-huh. which is which does not exist. <laughs> yep. There is no free labor. Yeah, it was. I mean, the profitability reports, customer profitability reports through MSP CFO, you know, were showing one thing. What we were seeing in our financials was another, right? Because those costs were getting loaded in. So yep. they were showing up in the PL, but not showing up in the individual agreement profitability reports. And so part of that process and moving on to kind of point four is, is defining, you mentioned those quick fix and immediate escalations and all of that. And yep. I, I'm imagining presentation mechanism doesn't matter, a flow chart, a table, or some sort of whatever, but defining, yep. hey, look, here's the 20, 30, what have you, most common ticket types you're going to see. Here's an other bucket to give you a catch-all. Here's what you need to do. You're allowed to work on these 15, Mr. Help Desk Tech or Mrs. Help Desk Tech. These five you can spend 20 minutes on. The rest of them go immediately off of your desk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, typically what we did is, you know, we had those quick fixes. And, and again, going back to some earlier points, it's really important to understand you know, a general volume, right? It's going to vary from one day to another, but you can kind of get a range. Like typically in a day, we get a hundred tickets of those hundred tickets, 30 of them are quick fix. Those quick fix tickets take about, should take about 15 minutes. You can do the quick math. Um, you know, that's what roughly eight hours a day or uh, something to that effect. Um, doing math on, on the fly may not be the smartest thing, but you know, roughly I think about eight hours, you know, you're going to say, okay, probably, and you want those guys readily available, guys and gals readily available. So maybe you need two folks to do that, uh, be on the quick fix tickets. And that's all they, that's all they focus on in your service coordinator, your dispatch, whatever you call it. They're directing those calls to, to the, those two folks. Um, and then you've got your, you know, level one plus, you know, folks that are, that are going to be your triage and really focus on what are the things beyond that, 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 that they can work on. And typically what I like to say is, you know, 30 minutes. And if you sure. don't have a path to resolution, then you need to kick it up. If you do have a path to resolution, then the service coordinator dispatcher should be checking in probably every 15 minutes. Cause you just don't want, you know, engineers want to solve problems. They're going to stick yep. on a problem forever. Um, and then, you know, eight hours later, they haven't solved the problem and, you know, the day's gone and they should have closed six tickets that day. And there's, they've only, they haven't even closed one because they've been working on the same one all day. Yep. So that's yep. typically the rule of thumb. And, you know, then when it goes to that level, level two, you know, they quickly have got to ascertain, can I, can I, do I have a path to resolution? If not, maybe it's a check-in with your, your escalation engineers. Hey, give me some direction or this is what I'm thinking. Am I on the right track? And, you know, through that dialogue, they can either figure out if they need to kick it up or they they take a shot at it. 
Yep. And then having that, uh, having that, that culture of understanding so that your tier one recognizes or your tier one plus recognizes, look, this isn't a punishment aspect, but if you spend six hours or all day on one ticket and don't solve it, it's bad for you. It's bad for the rest of the team and it's bad for the customer. And exactly. it's bad for every other customer that you weren't able to help. Yep, exactly. So we're, we're fighting an ocean here. It's not right. a, it's, it's right. not one thing you have to, you have to look at the big picture. Exactly. So looking at some key metric, you, you create some key metrics. Some of the areas um, that I think is going to be really important to spend a little bit of time on is we, we talk about in the documentation in the process, creating a blended average to be closed by your service team to create a goal for, hey, this is how many tickets, how many incidents should close per day. And then a goal around days tickets outstanding or days incidents outstanding. So how many, like a numerical representation of tolerance carryover, right? Because not every ticket that comes in on Monday is going to be closed on Monday. Sometimes it's Tuesday. Sometimes it's Friday. Sometimes, which like, it's horrible, but it's two weeks down the road. <laughs> so talk to yeah, us there's about... tickets that get open that are like, hey, I'm going to be out of the office in two weeks. While I'm out of the office, mm -hmm. can you fix this, right? It's in your system for, you know, 14 days. You're not going to do it. So, you know, it's not, you can't close it. Yep. Yep. If you close it, it's just going to make that client mad, right? They did right, their part. Right. They gave you two weeks notice for a scheduled item. What more can you ask from them? And that's why, you know, whether you're using formal SLAs or not, you should have some sort of uh, a priority in there. And typically what I would do is I'd put that down to a, a P5 for those two weeks. They don't, you know, that doesn't count against your metrics. And, um, and, and obviously have it scheduled for that day with a scheduled resource so it doesn't get lost in the mix. And then once it, once it, you know, the, maybe the day before or the day of the dispatcher service coordinator should then kick it back up to P3 because it needs to be solved that day or, you know, it was scheduled for that day. So it should be solved that day. Yep. And so when it comes to incidents outstanding, talk to us about creating a number bait, like a, a sane target for days, yep. days tickets outstanding. Yeah, I mean... It's going to be different for everybody, at least your starting point. I think the end point, um, you know, I will talk about what I think a good, what good looks like in that. But, you know, uh, there's been organizations that I've worked for and uh, I should probably start talking, start off by saying what, what does that DTO, as I call it, days tickets outstanding or DIO, I guess, days incidents outstanding mean. Um, so essentially for easy math, let's say you get a hundred tickets in a day. Yep. And what's on uh, what's on the backlog uh, is 200 tickets, right? So there's 200 tickets in the system, 100 tickets come in a day. Your DTO to your DIO is essentially two, right? Two yep. times the number of tickets that come in a day are on the board. Um, for some organizations, you know, I won't I spare, I won't uh, provide names to spare the innocents, but you know, coming in, those numbers can be, you know, 14 days. Yeah, yep. big, big, big numbers, right? Um, and we're not just talking about them having 100 days or 100 tickets a day. They're maybe having 200, 300 tickets. And so, I mean, these are big organizations, so it, it can get pretty massive and, and pretty quick. So in those cases, you guys, you can't immediately go from 14 days of tickets outstanding down to, down to two. So, you know, normally I, the second part of this math is, um, uh, again, for for easy uh, for easy math, let's say you have twenty techs. So on a normal day, they need to close five tickets a day to kind of keep up with the backlog or keep uh, current, right? If you've got twenty techs, let's and you've got this huge backlog, you've got to figure out a way to you know challenge them to say, hey, on average, there's some that's going to be way lower than this, some that's going to be way higher than this. We got to get seven tickets done a day or six tickets done a day. So that one extra ticket a day, of course, uh, across the course of a week, got 20 people, they're doing one extra ticket a day, that's 20, that's 100 extra tickets. So they're, every week, they're not only, they, they hopefully are not only closing that week's worth of tickets, but they're clearing another day worth of backlog. And so you kind of create this goal that, hey, in the month of March, if we do this, we're going to move from 10 days tickets outstanding down to 
uh, six days of tickets outstanding. We're going to continue that process into April. And then in April, we're going to move from six days outstanding down to two. Yep. And then the goal is, is I want to get like two is like kind of like the, the yellow zone, right? For me, roof you want to drive that down to probably one or under. Because again, you're going to have tickets that are waiting on vendors. You're waiting on the client to, to, to call back. You know, you got to roll a truck to replace something. There's going to be stuff that 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 um, gets impacted there. Yep. So two is kind of like, you know, we're marginally okay. One is probably, you know, we're we're get we're approaching great, and then anything if we can get to under one, we're in good 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 position. Um, yeah, you're, now you're getting that feedback that says service was so fast, fixed it so right. fast, which right. is a magic. Right. That's a magic right. phrase. Right. Right. You're, own, you're. It's almost like you're solving tickets in real time at that point. Yep. Um, uh, <clears throat> now, what that what that does? This is an unintended consequence. Is it creates a what I call a false work rate? Yep. Right. Now you've proven to the team like five tickets. You know, while we said five tickets was like ideal. We we've shown we can do six. Now, what I, what do you do with that, right? Well, now you've created some artificial capacity or real capacity in the system. Now you can go out and get more, you know, ideally get another client or two, and, and not have to fill more people in. And then, you know, key key here, reward those folks that are there, right? Mm-hmm. Give them a little bit of pay bump because they're actually doing more. Share the wealth with them, um, but. The, the other point that I want to make is in between the time that uh, you get the tickets down that low where you were to reasonable place or an ideal place in the time when you filled that capacity back up, what do you do with that work rate? If you don't, <clears throat> if you don't do something to artificially create that urgency again, yep. people are going to drift back. And now instead of closing six tickets, they're going to go, we only really need to close four. We'll still be underneath the metric. <clears throat> so what I suggest is, you know, in a scheduled sort of way, pull people out, put them in training, everybody, you know, one of the biggest things we always hear as leaders and MSPs is, hey, you want me to improve my skills? I don't want to, you know, there's always this tension between do I do it on the job or do I do it on my yep. own time? Uh, and I, the answer to me is yes, right? It should be both. Doctors, when they're you know, they get paid to learn and yep. they also, while they're, while they're working and then they, they also take time outside of uh, the job uh, to, yep. to continue to improve their skills and keep current on, on things. So, um, so pull them out, get them into Microsoft training, get them into Meraki training, get them into, you know, my, uh, Microsoft 365 training, get them into help, you know, give them a project to figure out how to use Intune Zero Touch to roll out PCs, whatever those things are, but be very disciplined, give them a goal, pull yep. them out for a week and say at the end of the week, we need this set up, or maybe you need all your documentations um, uh, uh, redone, pull them out, give them a yep. checklist that they're going to go through and make sure all your documentation is update updated and current. Create that artificial work rate so that everybody continues to kind of say, hey, Blended average, six a day per tech. We got, you know, before it was, we had 20 and we needed to close a hundred. Now we've got, you know, 15. And if we do six, we're going to get 90. So maybe it's, you know, somewhere between 15 and 17 yep. um, uh, to, to get to the point where we, uh, where we, uh, so you can maybe pull two or three, four people out just to create that urgency or, you know, uh, provide some help to the project guys to, to um, work through projects faster, build skills that way. So a lot of things you can do in that to, um, to increase efficiency, increase productivity and make your text better. Then really what we've, what we've been kind of exploring with that conversation <clears throat> is point eight around, this is that, uh, and, and the way it was, you phrased it uh, in the process is, is beautiful. Really. It's a culture of working during the workday. And so by, by creating that space and, and by, by artificially, by, by creating the urgency because, hey, this resource is out, they're doing training and now they're back in and this resource is out and they're doing training and now they're back in or doing a project or whatever. You create this 
culture of we need to when we're at work we need to be working and that doesn't mean that everyone's like a a dilaton right like we're not we're not yeah. just sitting there and, and robotic <laughs> we can have a fun culture we can enjoy the office we can enjoy work we can enjoy our team but we are there to work first yeah right yeah let me let me pause and put a pin in that real quick uh ian because i think it's important one of the things that you know has bothered me in recent years is I hear people talking about service factories, right? And while I agree, like the idea of a factory, we got, you know, a ticket coming in and working through the system and, you know, it comes out the other end and it's fixed. I, I get the concept. Um, but our, our employees, our team members aren't factory workers, right? They're knowledge workers. Yep. Um, and nothing against blue collar guys and gals, right? We need them in the world, but um, you know, especially our highly talented ones, they don't need to be treated different, but we got to understand like the commodity that they're bringing, the value that they're bringing is in their heads, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the skills and knowledge. You don't, we don't call, when we go to the doctor, we don't call them like, hey, we're going to the medical factory, right? <laughs> or, you know, when, when a plumber comes to work issues in our house, it's not like, hey, we're going to put them through the plumbing factory, right? No. <clears throat> so, um, you know, understand that there's skills that they've built, there's knowledge that they built, they're, they're knowledge workers. They have the ability with a couple keystrokes to take down thousands, if not millions of dollars of, of the commerce and industry, right? Think about that. Your lowest level tech okay. has the ability through, you know, some poor judgment to take down an organization pretty easily. Um, yep. So we got to, we got to honor and respect them as much. And I'd really encourage people to, maybe read a book like drive by Daniel Pink that really lays out like knowledge workers really want autonomy. They want mastery and they want purpose, right? They want to know why they're working. They want a skill that they can master and they want to kind of be left alone. Now as business owners, as leaders, we got to find that balance and there's a whole nother conversation around how do you, how do you build up to giving somebody autonomy, right? How do you um, mentor them, lead them to a point where, um, you can delegate those tasks and, and know that they're going to be accomplished the way you want to be accomplished. But uh, I'd encourage you to, your, you know, the folks on the call uh, in the webinar today and people that are um, watching this in the future, you know, pick up that book, understand what motivates your, uh, your team and your knowledge workers. Yeah, and creating that, uh, the, um, I got a piece of advice many years ago from Arnie Bellini that, really when when once you get to a certain size and you've started being able to delegate to individuals in your organization and trust the tasks are being done that an entrepreneur a, a leader in the company's key role is cheerleader and yeah. motivator and communicator in chief really yeah. uh, and, and and arnie used that term directly to me saying, get used to being a communicator in chief first, everything else is secondary, because if you're right. able to, to instill that, here's how you're making a difference, help desk tech, here's how you're making a difference, professional services engineer, here's how you're making a difference, even account manager, whatever, yeah. what have you, that, that reinforcement of the, of the individual and the team and the organization's value to the community as a whole gets everyone else juiced. And when your team's juiced, that's when the magic happens. Yeah. Quick story around that, Ian, just to, to kind of give an example. Um, I, you know, I was leading a pretty large team and we were having some discussions around this. And uh, one day, uh, uh, one of our clients, was a, which was a pretty big uh, title company in the area that uh, we were at, uh, who was a client, uh, they had an outage. They were a client of ours. They had an outage uh, mm -hmm. to the point where they couldn't print uh, the loan forms or the closing forms to to close things out. Yeah. Next day, uh, we're on our huddle, and um, one of the guys says, hey, what happened yesterday? I was at title agency yesterday trying to close on my house. They had to move. They had to move my closing till, you know, two days and whatever to move it out because you know they were down and they couldn't do the job that we were doing and that gave us an opportunity to go hey this is why that's important right there wasn't just bob who was there to close that day there i mean it was a large title agency there was 50 other 
you know, couples, families, individuals that were there hoping to get into their new house or sell their house that day. And now that's all been delayed. You know, what did it cost those people? What did it cost that business? And what did it, what, what did it cause, you know, the reputation with us? So, um, for, you know, that wasn't a mistake on our end, but it was something that, um, uh, uh, something that happened, uh, you know, that was a good example of how, what we do or don't do or how we respond impacts organizations. And it impacted one of our own team members that day. Yeah. And creating that, that, that scope of impact. So, 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 so key. And so looking, looking at kind of management. And so for those of you following along, just down to the management section, the KPI section, this is, um, I would really, really encourage everyone. If you read no other section of this document, take a look at these two areas. Um, but let's talk about these three questions that, uh, that, that you mentioned around reflection questions for, for, for a leader and for an organization to look at. And I'm just going to rattle off the three questions, which is, do you have the right type of clients? Meaning, do they, do they fit that target client profile? Are they bad fit clients? Do they, do they honor process? Are you charging the right amount? And that's really a, a, that value conversation versus price conversation. And then the last question is, do you have a deficiency or a gap in your service team? Can you spend just some time to, to talk about those three questions? Let's, let's start with the right type of clients. Like, how can you reflect on your client base honestly and say, like, are these the right type of clients? Yeah. Um, well, hopefully you're doing some tor some type of business review, whether it's a QBR, a TBR, an XBR, you know, whatever, ABR, <laughs> whatever <laughs> BR you're talking, right? But a business review with them. And, and it's not just showing up and saying, this is how many tickets we closed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how many, this is, you know, the amount of spam that we filtered out. These are the number of viruses we caught, right? Hopefully it is actually a business discussion and not just uh, let me tell you what we did for you to kind of discussion. And so, in there are recommendations, right? A good client that values technology is generally either A, gonna, gonna do the majority of the recommendations you suggest, or B, you're gonna have uh, at a minimum really good conversations around that. And there might you might need to explore some alternatives or figure out some creative ways for whether it's financing or other things to make that stuff happen, but they're gonna be open to that. Yep. If they are just kicking you know, a bunch of technical debt down the, down the road, they're not a good client. They'll never be a good client. You know, there is, uh, this was, you know, probably close to 10 years ago. I, w I went in, a sales guy was super excited. He thought he had a really good prospect. Um, you know, he, he brought me along to uh, kind of do the pitch and, and hopefully close the deal or at least, you know, get agreement in principle. Um, and um, I, uh, Hang on one second. I've got, I've got a phone call buzzing on everything. Uh, um, uh, so we walked into the office and I was like, almost immediately in the lobby as we talked to the, the front desk person, I looked over at the sales guy and I said, we're not going to be here that long. He kind of like got downtrodden. And, and, and let me just be clear. Uh, Operation service should be, you know, as frictionless as possible to the sales process. Yep. Um, you know, we should be saying yes more than we say no. Um, I just want to make that clear. And that's something that I've learned throughout my, my years. And I continue to learn that, right? Sales is hard. Uh, we, we've got to figure out more often than not ways to make, make stuff like that happen. But the reason why I said that is as I looked at that front desk and I could kind of see the office in the background, every desk had CRT monitors on it. <laughs> and I was like, this isn't, this isn't, this is not going to be good. Right. Their, their technology, nope. you know, is at least five years old. Um, so we went in and I got to a no really quick. Right. And not a N O, but a K N O W. Like I knew like this was not going to be a good fit. Right. They, they wanted a cheap, um, they wanted the, they wanted the cheapest. They weren't um, concerned about technology. They didn't see value in technology. Um, technology to them was an evil to be you know minimized. So, nope. 
those are some very quick ways that you can kind of uh, figure uh, figure out whether or not um, they're the right client or not. Um, is those kind of things, right? You know, are, are they taking your recommendations if they are an existing client? If you're just building up a bunch of technical debt that your service team has to hold on to, that's not going to be a good fit long term. Or as a prospect, if they're on old technology and aren't willing to entertain the idea of a big project on the front end of that to get, get that out, again, another warning sign. Yeah, and then sometimes just from a, from a, I'm a, sales guy through and through sometimes from the sales standpoint you can educate but a lot of the times those those organizations know yep. that they should be replacing it they're just not gonna they they don't value it but yep. if you can have those conversations around hey okay what what happens when billy joe up in reception when, when if her computer was down for the day what's the impact what happens to the organization and then you just map that out and uh and and are able to explore those costs with someone if they'll engage in that discussion you can create the awareness of what the real impact is and then suddenly the 500 700 thousand dollar computer replacement that you want to do every three years becomes a no-brainer because if they're down for one day yeah. they lost five times that much money right right so yeah, I mean, it's the same way with security these days, right? Nobody wants to spend money on security, and then all of a sudden they have an incident, and all of a sudden they've got tons of money to spend on security. And so thinking about charging the right amount, talk to us about this. Um, like it, it, we, we touched on this right at the top when we're, when we're looking into discounting to win the deal or price variability or deviation from standard this really really hits in a lot of different ways because if if one client's paying a, an average of two hundred dollars a chair and a different client's paying fifty dollars a chair and the fifty dollar a chair client is a ton of the workload while the two hundred dollar a chair client is not that much workload you've you've got a, a mismatch yep. in value received from your company where that two hundred dollar chair should be getting far more attention than a $50 chair client. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that happens more often like any of us would like, right, or mm -hmm. think. Um, and, and it tends to be like the, those suboptimal clients are the noisiest, get our, the most of our attention. And so it's a double whammy because we're pouring lots of money into a, 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 a client, an account that's not all that profitable. And we're not spending the time in the clients that it, there is opportunity or, or there is greater profitability. And so now we're getting pinched on because we've got these larger clients that have different expectations or are paying more, um, that we're not meeting their expectations. And we've got noisy clients that we're never going to, they don't understand. Like there's a client right now that's got a, that we're working with. Um, they have a, they have a VDI solution with us um, and they have a big team in India but they have this suboptimal internet connection. So every mm -hmm. night we get tickets from that India, that client in India going, why isn't the VDI solution working? And we're like, buy a decent internet connection and it will work. Right. Yep. And so, uh, but we, you know, there's, there's energy and calories expended there every day. And so internally we're going like, all right, we're going to raise their rates. Yep. Uh, and we're going to reduce their SLA. And, you know, maybe at that point it's worth it. Those calories, that calorie to expend are worth it, but, or it's going to encourage them to go find somebody else. Either case, we're going to be better off. Yep. And so kind of shifting gears on this, if, if you've walked through that conversation on, Hey, are our clients aligned with the type of organization we are are they are they a good fit are we having are we receiving the right amount of revenue and yes they're a good fit yes they've got you know yes this particular client is is being billed an appropriate amount that's really when it'll become that that third question almost becomes rhetorical right like i, I would imagine in that scenario with two yeses you'll say oh, we've got a a lack of skills around firewall management. We need to train yeah. on this or, you know, yeah. we just, we need to hire another tech. It'll bubble yeah. up. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you have to do it in aggregate, not individual, right? You have to go, hey, are eighty percent of our clients in that target profile? Are eight, are we charging within some percentile of the rate that we want to for, for the vast majority, right? You can have five clients that are your ideal clients that you're charging the right amount. Um, and you can have 25 clients that one or both of those questions are no. Again, those 25 clients are going to get an exorbitant amount of your time, which is going to create problems on those five counts. So you got to, it's really an, a question of that on aggregate rather than, a, a, uh, I mean, an individual thing can give you some clues, but again, I would encourage you to look at it in aggregate. Um, but yes, I mean, typically those, uh, you get eight to 80% in those first two questions and you're still having problems. You need to look at your leader and look at the team. And so we, we've, we've been run through this process quite a bit. I want to take a couple of minutes. Israel, you have, have, uh, have done, have, have worked with a lot of different organizations and now you, you have founded and operate NRT guides and, and just take a couple of minutes and tell us what does NRT guides do? What could people, what could people reach out to you to help solve at their organization? Yeah. So NRT guides is uh, three months old. So it's one of those things that's kind of evolving and, and mm -hmm. morphing as we go along, but NRT uh, stands for next right thing. So we really want to work with organizations and leaders to help them do the next right thing. Um, and so we're really focused on that. Um, Two things that we're currently doing today is uh, fractional COO work. So coming in, um, uh, working with a team. And when I say COO, I mean like not just over operations, but coming in and helping an owner, a founder, uh, typically somewhere between that three and seven million. We really want to help organizations, teams get from three million to five million and seven million dollar companies get to 10 million. That's really that sweet spot is really uh, where we want to focus our energy on and come alongside those owners, those founders, those leadership teams, provide some outside energy, provide some outside um, uh, uh, ideas and, 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 you know, capacity to kind of help move them along. So that's one way that we're helping organizations. Uh, similarly, but slightly different, it's coming alongside organizations and help those founders and leaders get a, get a shared vision. Uh, of where they want to be five years from now, 10 years from now. And and whether you call it, I can't probably use the word EOS because it's copyrighted and you know, <laughs> they come after people that use that terminology um, now. But in a very similar sort of EOS um, process, you know, I'm a strat like you, I'm a strat facilitator, really focused on strategy. Uh, I work with an organization called System and Soul that really vo works on um uh, execution, but it's also very focused on leadership and culture. Um, so those are the two areas that uh, we're working on today. I am building a team. I've got a, a number of former owners and other folks in the industry that are like, hey, we, we're interested in what you're doing. Um, I've, you know, I'm pretty much uh, uh, full up capacity wise now. I'm grateful for that. But I still have people coming out, coming and reaching out to me. And so I'm kind of being this uh, coordinator of, hey, I've got this business owner that really helped scale his organization from three to seven million and exited. Let, let's get you guys connected and he can help you with those processes. So that's probably going to be the next iteration as I'm, I'm slowly building this team around me to, to help uh, more organizations that I can do myself. I love that. I love that. So taking a Taking, taking a quick moment to just remind everyone, hey, if you, if you haven't downloaded it yet, go to the handout section, grab the process document that we just that we just ran through. There's quite a bit of meat and potatoes in there. This is this is a heavily valuable process. And let's just let's take a couple of audience questions. And I've got one here. And Israel, uh, the, the, this member asks that you know, it sounds like you've worked for a lot of different organizations, which is true. I, I, I can say that you've, you've worked for founder-led companies, you've worked for regional providers, you worked for private equity organizations and everywhere in between. What's the take on current industry trend? Where yeah. like what, what's happening right now in the space and where is it headed? 
Yeah. Well, I think private equity is, you know, is kind of where it's at today. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, everybody's focused on that. And I think that's as a result of, you know, some, some of the original TSP, MSPs, whatever that, that owner demographic getting to a point where they're thinking about retirement and trying to do what's next. Um, uh, and, and some of it's just, you know, some of the crazy multiples that, uh, P guys are offering. Mm -hmm. Um, so I sort of have a love hate relationship with P. Uh, I love it, um, because it's made a lot of my friends, um, wealthy. Uh, I love it because when I was at ConnectWise and, and Thomas, Tomo Bravo bought us, um, the equity that I had, um, in ConnectWise helped pay for my two oldest daughters, uh, college education. So I love it for that. Um, but my concern, and it maybe hate is the wrong, is too strong of a word, but my concern is what private equity is doing to cult the culture of organizations. Um, how it, it, private equity, and I'm speaking a lot of generalities here, Ian, yep. but in my, yep. from my perspective, private equity looks at MSPs like factories, like um, those knowledge workers are disposable uh, and they're not really worried about the culture of an organization, you know, quite as much, right? Um, for anybody that's gone through any due diligence, you know, they're, they, they're anything that they can get in a spreadsheet, they love. Mm -hmm. But, you know, very rarely do they ask about what's your, what's your um, employee NPS score or your employee satisfaction score? Th those don't come up. I don't, I've never been through a due diligence where that comes up. So, um, so one of the things that I'm just ruminating, and this is me just talking out loud right now with three and three minutes and 20 seconds ago in this is, is there a, is there another path? Is there a way to produce liquidity events for founders and owners uh, that give founders and owners the, the financial return for all their years of hard work, mm -hmm. um, but preserve the culture and the ethos and value people um, the way I think the way, you know, what, what's so important to me in the industry is, you know, finding that balance between relationships and results, strategy and culture, mm -hmm. people and profit. Right. Um, and so what, you know, what I'm spending some cycles on and, and really a lot of the owners and founders that I'm working with share this mentality and share this, this ethos is how can we do it different? And so that's really what I'm, you know, it's more about what I'm thinking these days, um, but it's mm -hmm. also through experience, right? Uh, the number of, you know, I get calls from owners that are like, love that I got millions of dollars in my bank account, but boy, like none of the people that were there when I sold are there anymore. Yep. And that, uh, that that's almost like a, a function of the nature of PE because it is a it is an investment vehicle, right? If you are a person who is putting money into a PE fund, the reason you're giving it to PE instead of just investing it into stocks or bonds or mutual funds or what have you is you want a higher return. Yeah. You could just throw it against the S&P and get your 5 to 7% over the course of 10 years. You want greater than market performance, you're trying an alternative investment vehicle and yeah. It, it is only about the money for the investor, which makes it only about the money for the PE fund, which creates a dichotomy between that and a founder led organization or, or a team of entrepreneur led organization where there is a passion about more than money. Yeah. Like, and I money think there's some, there's some organizations that are getting this and there's some of them are PE back to think evergreen, you know, they, they had a few misses on the front end of their, their journey into the MSP space, but I think they've got more dialed in now than they have before. And I think they appreciate uh, some of the things that we're talking about. Uh, and I think, I can't remember the other organization, but Mitch Morgan is the CEO of it. Um, and uh, I think the way they're approaching it um, is closer to the kind of thing that I would like to be a part of and, and closer to my idea of, again, how do we, how do we provide a liquidity event, but also um, uh, value people. Yeah, and, and create that create that space. And so, Israel, we got 32 seconds left. What's kind of the final thought to take us all home? Uh, yeah, uh, measure what matters. Inspect what you expect. Um, first thing is kind of 
understand the ins and outs, the inputs and outputs, and create some expectations around that. Make sure everybody on your team understands those expectations. Uh, reward people when they hit those expectations and, you know, be consistent in, in uh, allowing people that don't know um, they're meeting it to know that they're missing the mark. 